All right, it is 12 o'clock. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Courtney Sand, and I will be your moderator today for our webinar entitled Assessment and Resource Facilitation by Jeff Lauer, our Executive Director at the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa. Please feel free to use the chat box function to make comments and ask questions throughout today's webinar. And note that this webinar will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube page within the next few days. Welcome, Jeff Lauer. Well, thank you, Courtney. Thank you very much. Um, for those who are here live and those who join at a later time, uh, this is early December of 2022. Um, I'm sitting in Southeast Iowa. I'm a white male. Um, middle-aged with glasses and a blurred background, so you can't see much behind me. Um, had the great honor to be executive director of the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa for going on 20 years and involved in the Brain Injury Association of America and United States Brain Injury Alliance in leadership roles for most of that period and uh, in another 10 years on top. So been plugging along for quite a long time. Um, one of the challenges that we all have across the brain injury spectrum is figuring out what data can best guide us to serving and supporting people with brain injury. And that's been a bit of a bugaboo for more than my career um, because brain injury is well, for those of you who know Dr. Who, it's wibbly wobbly. It's a little bit squishy. And that maxim that we often use or cliche that if you know one person with a brain injury, you know one person with a brain injury. No two brain injuries alike. People come to brain injury with unique bio, psycho, social, medical, financial, educational, legal um, dynamics. And then they have an injury that is variable depending on location, severity, rehabilitation, other medical conditions that play into it, um, the duration and intensity of rehab, if they had any, what their geographical status is, it goes on and on. So trying to tease out stuff is difficult. However, uh, we are, we're gonna take a little stab at uh, how the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa has approached this over the last uh, decade or more and where we're at right now. So um, let's see if I can advance these slides. I'm gonna take my video off so I have a little bit more bandwidth going on and then I'll come back on uh, later. If you do have questions or comments, please use the chat box. Uh, Courtney will interrupt if uh, something's off and, and we'll also catch those at the end of this, I'll leave some time for that. Courtney, can you flag me when we're, we've got about 10 minutes left? Sure can. Thank you so much. So why assessment? So levels of, of referral for resource facilitation and frankly across North America and, and the world in terms of uh, social services have increased significantly in the last couple of years. And the pressure on resource facilitation programs to, to carry out as assessments is growing despite limited increases in funding. There's, there's also a request and often a requirement by funders for a cogent rationale for how services are deployed, who gets what, when, how long, what intensity. And that's not unreasonable, but sometimes it's unreasonable. Um, Dr. Lance Trexler noted um, in, a, uh, in a journal article from, I'm trying to remember when Lance put this up, now I'm going to blank, the last few years, that there's been an increase, interest in what resource facilitation for brain injury is in the past decades. And that's in relationship to medical and policy practitioners trying to understand what are value-based service models for long-term services and supports for people with brain injury. And value is a loaded word. It's not only uh, economic value, but it's also what really makes a difference in people's lives. And so after brain injury, as, as many of you know, there is a maze 
to navigate that is constantly shifting uh, rules, eligibility, access, geography, um, quality, intensity across medical, social service, social security, veterans administration, mental health, substance abuse, um, vocational support, if there are corrections issues, um, people's individual trajectory of recovery, and many other factors. And these are hard enough to navigate for people who are quote unquote neurotypical, whatever that might mean, let alone somebody or a family who is encountering the challenges of recovering cognitively, behaviorally, emotionally, physically after a brain injury. And that's where resource facilitation had its roots. Uh, the roots of resource facilitation reach back quite a long time. Uh, in the 70s, there was an increasing number of children and young adults who were surviving brain injury, and they were being funneled into programs that were more specialized and developed for people with intellectual disabilities. And understandably, there was some resistance to that because brain injury does not inherently cause a decrease in in intelligence and they're frankly different populations. And so that little red circle down there is kind of the person who's still in the seventies kind of trying to find a way up into reaching the stars um, or maybe these are the neurons I think, but it's all good, um, trying to move forward. And in 1984 and 85, two of the M states, Missouri and Massachusetts deployed staff to take information and resource information and referral to another level. Um, in Missouri, it was originally funded by a CDC grant to reduce secondary health outcomes, secondary injuries amongst people with brain injury. And there were two statewide service coordinators deployed to the head injury program. Um, some who might know Susan Vaughn, uh, who worked in the Missouri Department of Health was a leader in developing this and has also been a national leader. 1985, um, Massachusetts Rehab Commission added service coordination as part of its statewide head injury program. And Deb Kamen and others after her were really instrumental in expanding that as roots for RF. But it was still very limited. <laughs> so fast forward uh, in the 90s, we had 16 states across the country providing something that ranged from basic information referral on a statewide basis, all the way up to intensive case management for brain injury. But those services were not connected with each other. Um, and, and we've all been um, trying to figure this out as we go. The, it's, a, it's, it's been a new field to try to dig into. It certainly has linkages and roots in case management, in social work, in AIRS, um, the American uh, Institute for Resource uh, Facility for Resource and Information. There are a lot of programs out there that we have borrowed from over the years. So, um, whoops, where's my picture? There it is. Uh, so in 1990, oops, that's the wrong slide, stand by. Got to figure out if I can get forward in this. Let's see. There we go. It's and still, Jeff, on, on my end, it's still showing the title slide. It really? It is? Yeah. yeah I don't know if, and if anybody else can throw a message in the chat box. Mine is showing the title slide currently. Oh, sorry. Mine is advancing. Thank you for Yeah. For um, let's see. I'm going to stop share. Okay. And I'm going to try to reinitiate the share. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah, and if that doesn't work, Jeff, you're welcome to send the PowerPoint to me and I can advance it for you. Has the stop share uh, ceased? Let me see. It shouldn't have. You are still, oh, let's see. I'm going to go. Ahead. You're still a co host. You should be able to screen share still. Can you not? There you go. Okay, what do you see now? It says RF roots, and then there's a square that says 1999. Perfect. So thank you. It looks now I'm going back a slide. What does it say now? 1990s. Great. And, and now, uh, let's see, how about this one? Uh, 1984. 
Okay. Mr. Wright. Yeah, we're going advanced, so I'm just going to keep going. Okay. I'm so sorry for um, not having that operational. Got to love technology. We've got our roots. There we go. Forward to 2000. In got it. Yeah, we, are we there? Resource facilitation, a consensus of principles. There was a national meeting organized by the Brain Injury Association of America. And at that time, the federal agency that was um, organizing the federal grant program for states uh, around the TBI Act. And it, it was to, to defined as trying to get a, a consensus of principles and best practices to guide program development for brain injury. And Courtney, I'm, I'm just gonna describe uh, what's on this slide that the basic principles for development and operation of our yep. effort. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we're good, thank you. Mm -hmm. these, these were individualized that facilitation is accessible, holistic, effective and valued, participant driven, creative and flexible and builds community partnerships. And then we added in 18, um, it's outcome driven in ways that are meaningful to key constituents. Uh, that, I'm gonna put, put a, I'm gonna pin this slide conceptually and we'll come back to this just later on and I'll, and I'll mention why and you'll know why later. So then we've got some success in the 2000s around the, around the country. Resource facilitation had a name from that consensus statement. Um, it was being developed in many states. Minnesota got a, a nice chunk of money from their State Department of Justice to build a database they allowed uh, many states to jump onto that. We've used it for many years to track client outcome data, and we're migrating to Salesforce this year um, simply because it is, it's more robust. Uh, it wasn't around at the time, but great thanks to Minnesota Brain Injury Alliance for their efforts for more than a decade for many of us. And Iowa launched its resource facilitation. We added the word neuro on the front of it, neuro resource facilitation in 2005. Yay, smiley face, people in the trees. Okay, my little graphic is done. So what about this assessment? Why assessment? Why talk about it? I am so sorry if you tuned into this and you're thinking, I don't care because a lot of folks really, this is a bit dry until you're asked to justify the services and support you're giving and you wanna be able to evaluate them for a couple of reasons. One is to communicate to funders, constituents. In our case, we're a nonprofit. Our board holds us accountable for doing work that is accountable to them. And it, there's just a, a component here of getting baseline data and seeking continuous quality improvement. Can we continue to do better in serving Iowans with brain injury and their families and working with our colleagues around the country to do so. So the purpose of assessment is to provide a supportive or therapeutic response to meeting the needs or resolving problems, in our case of people with brain injury and their families. And we've done a lot of stuff to try to get there. I'm just not gonna lie. We have tried and at some point we've said this isn't working. Um, I know that some of our staff have been as I have, a little frustrated when we wave goodbye to a, um, a, a rubric or an assessment that we've tried and it didn't give us the kind of quality outcomes we wanted. It was helpful for a while, we've moved on. We started with the service obstacle scale. Uh, these slides will be available. Uh, we moved to, a, a and that, that's actually developed by Kreutzer and colleagues at UVA and it's available for folks who want to see it. If you don't know the COMBI, C-O-M-B-I, C-O-M-B-I, if you search COMBI and brain injury, you'll find a whole great raft of great assessment scales for brain injury. We uh, created our own barriers rating scale internally. We use the Mayo Portland Adaptability Inventory for some period of time. And what I'm talking about today is the development of our um, a newer version of our NERF and risk assessment. So this is kind of always been like building an airplane and working on it while it's in the air. And that's uh, a little bit disconcerting for all of us. I know that staff often feel like, um, you know, we're, we're, as I deploy and suggest different ways to 
assess, they are looking and saying, come on, this is hard enough to fly with you. Um, can, we, can, can we slow down a little bit? And so I grabbed this stock photo, as you can see. Uh, in any event, our early efforts were using a service obstacle scale called the SOS. And it had questions that we would ask to our clients. What we moved away from after a while was there was a, a double negative or a negative uh, frame here that was difficult for clients and frankly our staff to wrap their heads around where they're asking, instead of are you satisfied with the amount of professional help, the questionnaire was I am, are you, I am dissatisfied. Do you disagree strongly to strongly agree? And we didn't feel like we were getting consistent coherence. And so we moved away from the SOS, although it did give us some interesting measures um, showing decent outcomes initially. We then created a, a range of barriers that we discerned were common for people with brain injury and their families, including education, housing, uh, fiscal issues, so sorry about that, um, transportation, insurance, vocational, secondary, awareness, uh, a whole range of areas. Connection to services was one of our primary goals that we wanted to look at. And I've got a red arrow here. Uh, this graph shows that we've got about 180 people, oh, 186, who responded uh, at, at intake to our clients being surveyed on this. We asked them at that point, um, many of them had barriers to understanding what services they could connect to and how. What we found in rating them at three months, six months, 12 months and 18 months, and here, for example, three months later, we did lose clients because we had uh, some drop out or not respond, but we had a, a significant decrease in those, the ratio of barriers to no barriers. Um, so this was helpful. We felt like, well, we're doing something right, but it wasn't as helpful in scaling, particularly because we had to track our cohorts across the same time periods. And that actually proved more difficult for our capacity to do, to do regular data analysis than we would have liked. And so again, try again, fail again, and we failed better. Um, we are currently in a situation where we sat back and assessed internationally the kinds of key assessment areas that public health, rural public health organizations, that case management organizations, uh, that social work organizations, and that brain injury organizations across the, the globe as, as evidenced by Google. Um, and we used samples and examples from Namibia, Australia, Canada, the US, and Britain. And we looked to see what the overlap was regarding the areas of import, the areas of risk that seem to put clients at risk, not just medically, but geographically, psychologically, socially, financially, legally, a range of areas. And so we came up with a number of areas. And I'm gonna try, Courtney, to stop here and to switch um, into a different platform. So hold on a second. I'm gonna share screen again, and I'm going to do my best to go to the correct document. And are, do you see a yep. Word document, Courtney? Yeah, yep, Excellent. the assessment waiting rubric. Yep, there we go. Perfect. So what we did is came up with some key and core categories that align both with um, many valid and reliable studies of assessments for, again, as I mentioned, case management, public health nursing, um, public health in general, social work, um, substance abuse, et cetera. 
And we chose and selected a limited number of these that seemed also to align with our caseload. I'm just gonna walk through them. Housing, uh, history of law enforcement, employment status, the, the need, the case complexity, meaning how many organizations or agencies are collaborating around a case? How many folks, how many cooks are in the kitchen? And that also demands what, what we consider, a, it suggests a level of case complexity for our staff. Substance abuse, mental health issues, which is a case complexity area, communication, the capacity of people to communicate clearly and effectively, um, other complex health conditions, and we're gonna jump and I'll show you the list of those as well, because often brain injury presents with very significant um, health issues. We learned that as we started to do a deeper dive into serving individuals after stroke. Uh, stroke, as most of us know, is either ischemic or hemorrhagic. It means there's either a blockage or, or a hemorrhage. It's often associated with other conditions that are cardiopulmonary, diabetes, um, diet, uh, exercise, and folks have a higher propensity of having a second stroke after a first stroke. And so we wanted to make sure we we took some of those issues into consideration, not because we're providing medical advice, but because we want to touch base with people to see that they still have contact and are, are maintaining connection with their primary care providers. And we ask if they're not, would they like some support and assistance? Um, we want to know what kind of supports they have, quality supports in the human service arena, by, by brain, particularly by brain injury professionals. Do they have high access to another team of brain injury professionals that are paid for either by insurance, by the Medicaid waiver, et cetera? And, and we wanna know that because uh, we we're trying to triage to some extent who and how we allocate staff resources to. Their natural supports, um, who in their family or community, friends or other non-paid people do they have on deck to help them? Their geographical distance to access, and we call that an urban hub, and we arbitrarily define that as greater than 50,000 in population. We're in Iowa, folks. And so uh, we listed some of those urban hubs that we have either in Iowa or on bordering states. Now, is this the only way to do it? No, but it's working for us as, um, as a, a general guide to how far somebody has to travel and, and what is their ability to travel to, to get to where they need. And then, so as not to have this boxing people in to a, to a rubric, to an algorithm that we are basing service allocation to, we want our nurse staff, who are the ones who are assessing these variables, to consider any additional areas or risks that may be going on. And so those can be qualitative assessments by Courtney and her colleagues. Courtney's a resource facilitator on our team. Um, they can, they're qualitative issues or quantitative issues that they describe. And they can put their thumb on the scale, so to speak, and increase risk or complexity for clients for a given period of time if they see that there's a fire. The other component here is that question eight, which was around what health conditions that people may have. We wanted to provide some guidance for our staff. So um, we used, I'll go down to the uh, citation first, Institute of Medicine uh, had a committee on serious and complex medical conditions that we borrowed this from, pulled it right out of actually, and um, conditions that are life-threatening, that cause serious disability without necessarily being life-threatening, that can cause interruption to life activities, a guide for our staff to keep in mind when they're ranking question number eight about medical 
issues and how significant they are, where and what are common intense, I'll say, uh, medical conditions. If somebody had foot fungus, I don't think it would show up on here. Uh, that's an example of something that would have been ruled out. But um, other things that are um, mental health related, uh, sight, uh, neurocognitive deterioration, diabetes. So we've given guidance to staff on how to rank that question. When we went through these and landed on them, we started to see some trends that were quite interesting in our caseload. And I'm gonna show those in a second, but I'm gonna pop back, I'm gonna stop share and go back to the main PowerPoint uh, presentation, if I can find it. That's always a big if. Here it is. Okay. Um, are we back on? Let's just go. Are you on Maslow's hierarchy, Courtney? Yes. Excellent. So we had those areas. And we looked at those after having done, well, first of all, we took the questions and we ran them through a process of intercoder reliability. A, a great number of our clients have two or more staff that work with them. I partner with a number of staff on clients. Uh, Courtney and I have partnered on some interesting and challenging cases, as well as Courtney and her other colleagues partner together. Uh, we don't always have one client per staff because sometimes we have to split up the load and sometimes folks need some brainstorming. So we ended up with, oh, I think we had 20 or 30 clients that had had at least two staff who knew their case as well. Um, I'll back up here. With housing, for example, with these questions, we ran through, whoops, we ran through and asked our staff to assess each of the clients that we chose based on, based on these areas. And then we looked at the score outcome and we were, I think at about an average of 70% cohesion or intracoder reliability, which wasn't good enough. So we ran that through 17 times. So this is the 17th draft of our nurse nerf assessment and and I it says waiting rubric here and I'll get to that in a second we we managed to get up above 90% with changing the questions and then working with staff to drill down to the concepts to to discuss as a group and kind of come to a cultural cohesion about what we were interested in and asking about within the housing or employment or transportation dimension. So that again, we felt we were asking the same questions. And we'll pause again and go back and revisit that uh, after about six months and see, do we still have both some reliability, which is our people clustering around the same area and validity are we hitting the target that we hope to hit? Are we getting alignment and scores? And there'll likely be some drift. We have a new staff person started this week and uh, we're gonna have to kind of bring her into this mix and work with her to understand again, our, our coherence on this. Um, it's doable. And it's uh, as my friend, John Corrigan from OSU says, oh, this is the back of the napkin assessment, uh, you know, from John's perspective, that's true. As an academic researcher, he has access to a much more robust capacity to validate the reliability and validity of his studies. We have to have something that's good enough. And I think we feel like we can hang our hat on this. We did find that not all of these categories, whoops, not all these categories, housing, transportation, substance abuse, intense medical conditions were equal. Um, for example, the number of the natural supports that people had 
didn't feel like it should be scored and compared the same with the same weight as somebody with a serious mental health and or um, a, a serious medical condition that was life-threatening. So we took a deep breath and we paused and we went to our programs and services committee of our board who are our expert resources, many with um, PhDs and uh, terminal degrees. And we asked, what do you think? And we were delightfully guided back to a, a basic concept which many of us learn in undergrad, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, this is not perfect either, but it did give us some guidelines on how to frame these areas in terms of essential life and survival factors, physiological needs, safety needs, and Maslow called it love and belonging. Um, I don't know that, well, we knew that that was an important piece. When we looked at the questions to drop them into these categories, we only ever got as high as friendship, family, and sense of connection. We do feel that those are valuable components of social capital, of community connection, of, of success in living well with brain injury, and we want to support those. We felt like if there were categories that fit into the esteem or self-actualization, that's probably outside of our wheelhouse. Um, those, are, those are complex areas that we might refer somebody to a, a counselor or a therapist if they had access to. And frankly, there are enough people with physiologic and safety needs that we need to prioritize working with those folks when they get referred to the program. And that's part of what this is, is to make sure that we're not missing the boat and spending an overt amount of time with people who are struggling with status and recognition issues. Not that that's not important to those people, it is. However, we're trying to prioritize helping people get by and survive often very difficult situations after brain injury. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second and jump across to a, another uh, location, share screen. And where is it? Microsoft Word, here we go. All right, yeah, hopefully we're seeing word. Yep. Um, waiting in rubric. Okay, that's not what I was looking for. Stand by. It'll have to do. So what we found was that many of the categories, for example, housing, would be if they were highly stable, stable, or uncertain they were less of a risk to somebody as compared to occasionally unstable, meaning they were couch surfing or they had temp housing or very unstable. These presented significant risks to people being able to connect with services. And so we decided that we needed to weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, these two scores a little higher to put our thumb on fours and fives and we're multiplying those by a, weighting them by a factor of 1.5. So a four becomes a six and a five becomes a 7.5. With law enforcement, um, we, we decided not to do any weighting at all. We just let these run as they are. I'm not gonna go through all of them. These are just examples of how we're weighting. Employment status was interesting, I think. Um, in that in the level of risk for one, two, and three, un, uh, currently employed, underemployed seeking employment, or underemployed, um, um, I can't say it, underemployed or unemployed seeking employment without supports, they were significant to people, 
but if somebody was at risk of losing their job, we wanted to be alert to that because the literature is very clear that the best job that people have a chance to keep and hold is the one that they might have had before their injury. And so we want to try to, if somebody does have a job from an employment standpoint, we want to put our thumb on that and we used, a, 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 we're doubling the score of a four, that becomes an eight. And that'll give us a chance to look at that a little bit more intensely. And I'll show you how and where we look at that. Uh, and then this last one um, has one year or less of stable employment. Um, we pumped up to 1.5. So we're weighting these differently. Last example is we're down weighting um, some of these based on the, the, again, a little less intensity for very low, low and average collaborators and higher intensity for high and very high. So within these components, we're playing with the numbers. All right, stopping share for a second, coming back. Forgive me for dancing around so much, but it's the best I could do so that it could be visual. Is the, um, how high are you back on screen, Courtney? Yes, it is. Awesome. So again, what we found uh, uh, here is that across those physiologic safety and love and belonging factors, there were some that were just clearly in the, the, the if you will, the base of Maslow's hierarchy, housing, substance abuse, health conditions. Um, some that like collaboration that we believed and came to consensus as a team were in the next two tiers up, depending on how intense they were, um, and others that were just solo in the safety area. And so the scoring was based on um, or within Maslow's a rubric around physiologic safety and, um, if you will, love and belonging or less intense factors. Okay, so what does it give you? Well, it gives us some interesting initial data um, about our caseload. Level of risk for housing. Uh, we have 44% of our caseload that is highly stable, but we do have a significant portion that is uncertain, unstable, or very unstable. It's a... Uh, it's an area for us to look at so that our staff and our organization continues to work with housing authorities to develop better acumen on what housing options there are across the state for people with, for brain injury, people with brain injury. In terms of law enforcement risk and engagement, again, the majority of people here um, know or very low, yet, we did have some in the very significant or extreme zone. You know, this looks like there's about 11% of our caseload that um, have some serious stuff going on. And for those clients, we want to A, have a way for our staff to keep them kind of at the top of, at top of mind relative to these issues. And as they develop plans to work with these clients, to keep these areas in mind because our planning with our clients is collaborative. Uh, and yet, if somebody is wanting to work on status or self-esteem issues and they are in trouble with the, the law, we would best bring that to their attention that that might be an area to continue to, to look at. Um, the other piece that this allows us is the capacity, and this is for one of our staff to have them have client caseload scores that are not meant to box people in, but are meant with, with them, with uh, the, the director of programs and services on a regular basis to look at which clients uh, have their hair on fire, so to speak. Um, this client, I blacked out the names, but client number 154 
has a score of 48.5, uh, has some serious work issues, mental health uh, concerns, and low natural supports. Um, a health condition in the caution area, cognition and communication that aren't the best. So as in this case, our staff person by the initials of AA goes through her week and her month, um, she might be attending more, she should, we hope, be attending more to folks that are above, in her case, if you will, the 25th, you know, a level 25. This is her, this is her caseload that has the most challenges right now. This is her caseload that she's assessing right now that have her least challenges. We will assess people, oh gosh, Courtney, you probably remember, just t correct me if I'm wrong, uh, on a, a quarterly basis? Uh, with the risk assessment or the follow-up calls? With the, uh, the NERF assessment. Um, we do it initially and then at three months and then as needed moving forward. Very good. And if I'm not mistaken, we can do it anytime something changes significantly. Absolutely. And so this needs to, this is uh, ideally going to be a fluid score. How do we keep track of all this? Um, God love Max Winkler from Colorado. Uh, he's a former staff person at the Brain Injury Alliance of Colorado. We've worked with BIA Colorado to uh, work with Max. And he is building Salesforce for us that has the weighting algorithm already in it. So staff will be able just to enter the raw numbers as they go. Uh, they'll have the questions there and they'll have that medical cheat sheet, hopefully on their bulletin board. Um, and these will generate the scores in, frankly, in real time as they need to update John Black, who maybe has a new critical health condition and needs to have that be flagged. Somebody can move from, if you will, a less intense case up above. All right, so going forward here, what are our next steps around this? Why do this? Well, a couple of interesting things going on in this area. We don't, I don't believe we've got the holy grail of assessment right now. We've developed something that we believe will be efficient, effective, allow us to improve and increase the quality of our services to allocate, uh, to allocate resources um, as needed to be able to justify the allocation of the monies we get, particularly from the public sector and frankly from donors and to, and to do this with accountability and some transparency. Is it perfect? No, we're still flying this plane while we're building it. Fortunately, there's a Nidler grant, the National Institutes for Disability, um, Development of Disability Research have funded a five-year chronic condition management study that's a partnership between Ohio State University and the Indiana University that's called Be Healthy. That is got some sub projects, one of which uh, has been allocated to NASHA, the National Association of State Head Injury Administrators for a national assessment of assessments. And so we hope in the coming year or so to know what other states are doing like this and to have a better scan, national scan playbook on how we might improve ours and, and frankly, if ours might be able to inform other people. At, I think at, as we speak, the executive director of the United States Brain Injury Alliance, USBIA, his name is Gavin Atwood, is in San Francisco on the dime of Salesforce because they've seen that a, a core number of states providing resource facilitation have migrated to Salesforce to do this, and they want to know what they can do as an organization to better build out effective templates for brain injury resource facilitation. And so there's a national um, meeting of minds on how to come together 
to perhaps build a common set of data elements and maybe, which might be uh, really helpful, a minimum data set so that Iowa could compare how we're doing to Nebraska. And if they are in Nebraska is ahead of the curve in certain areas, we can call um, our colleagues over there, Peggy Reicher and others, and say, how are you getting these outcomes? Do you guys have better services and supports in these areas? Or are you just more knowledgeable? And either way, help us understand how we can either improve our ability for people to connect or advocate from a policy level for better services and supports in key areas. And again, those comparable outcome measures can't help but help. All right, um, that might be it. What do we got for time? It's 12.45. Yep, we do have one question, um, yep. Jeff, that came up. Please. I don't know, is, is the feedback, are you getting feedback? Jeff, do you mind muting yourself while I talk? I hear feedback when we both have ourselves off of mute. Are, are you able to do that? I'm on, I'm muting now. Okay, perfect. I'll ask the question and then I'll put myself on mute. I've noticed if we're both on, we get some feedback. Um, Roxanne Coggle asked, or she said, since seizures and epilepsy aren't on the list in that health condition um, part of our risk assessment, she would like to know if, if those conditions, seizure and epilepsy, are represented in the health condition column. And I'll go ahead and put myself on mute. Thank you, Roxanne. Sometimes when you get into the forest, you forget the trees. Um, making note to go back and make sure that seizures and epilepsy are in there as a key component. Other than that, Jeff, I don't see any other comments or questions. No problem. Let me just share with folks that, uh, again, this is a work in progress. There's a lot of turf covered. The, if, uh, if you or other members of staff um, are interested in looking at what we've got, it is absolutely open to the public domain. We would be delighted to share uh, the process and or the outcomes as they move forward. They are not proprietary. Um, they're the best we've been able to manage. I put this, we put this, um, webinar together, not only for folks in Iowa, our colleagues and collaborators, but then also there are other states and other resource facilitation programs that can look at this um, on their own time and, and see whether there's pieces that they can either beg, borrow, or steal, or give a shout and say, hey, have you thought about adding seizures and epilepsy? Thank you, Roxanne, truly. Um, we did not intentionally overlook that. and. I'll go back and look at those conditions and see uh, where it fits if it's not in there. Last chance for anybody to um, chat. All right. Well, um, on behalf of the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa, thanks for joining us uh, if you're in central time over your lunch hour. And if you're somewhere else at some other time, um, hope it's lovely where you are. Uh, this is Jeff Lauer with the Brain Injury Alliance. Uh, contact information is on screen, but you can reach us at info at BIAIA.org. That's info at BIAIA.org. Thank you, everyone.